Well, it's been quite a year, and I don't think I'm being excessively gloomy in saying that it's been a year in which lots of rather bad things have happened. Uh, we've had war in Ukraine. We've had a lot of economic anxiety and rampant inflation. Uh, we have had strikes breaking out everywhere. Um, Andrew, if I may start with you, uh, a lot of people compare it to the 1970s and the winter of discontent. Do you think such talk is exaggerated? Uh, yes, the only people who are comparing it to the 1970s never lived through the 1970s. <laughs> and you, you just have to look at a chart of strikes just to take one metric. Uh, and strikes in the 70s, they're, they're massive compared to now. I mean, it is true that we're in probably the most strikes in 10 years, uh, though we've yet to reach a stage where any of these strikers really win. And I noticed that even Mr. Lynch of the RMT is getting increasingly irascible in broadcast interviews, which suggests to me that he thinks he's going to lose now. I did warn him in July of this year that he didn't have the power he thought he had, that working from home had changed all that and that the railways were not as essential as before. So, yeah, it's been a pretty grim year. I agree with that. But it's nothing like the 70s. We, in Britain, we've not had to call in the uh, IMF. Whereas we did in the 70s, there aren't strikes every day and the unions win every strike, which happened in the 70s. That's not happening. Inflation has not reached 25%, which it did in the 1970s, even though it's high. And interest rates, last time I looked, are still, what, around 2%, 2.5%, whereas uh, then, in these days, they were over 20%. So, you know, and Jimmy Carter had just come down from the mountain known as Camp David to say that America was gripped in a malaise. Now, America has a lot of problems, but it's not quite a malaise at the moment. So it's not. It's difficult. It's tough. It's tough for people having to live through these times. It's... Uh, Difficult compared to years gone by, and I think I, I would also say I think the reason why it seems so grim is that this was really meant to be the year where we we on both sides of the Atlantic we boomed back from the pandemic. It was to be back to normality, growth would return, prosperity would return, and the combination of the war in Ukraine and inflation, uh, which are linked. Um, has meant that we've not boomed back at all. In fact, we're kind of treading water. Lionel, do you think um, our industry, the media, uh, I know you're a novelist, but you also do a bit of media. Um, uh, do you think we're to blame slightly for creating this climate of uh, gloom? I mean, I keep reading about general strikes and there hasn't been a general strike since 1926, I think. Uh, and there's this sort of sense that actually, is it really a general strike? Because actually, as Andrew says, it's not really in the same sense. Um, are we journalists to blame for creating this climate of, of despair? I think that might be giving journalists a little too much credit. credit. <laughs> I mean, everything that we're talking about is real and not the invention of the media. Um, and there, even if the strikes are not as terrible as they were in the 1970s, um, what is driving the strikes is is substantial. I mean, it's, uh, for one thing, it's the consequence of uh, the lockdown policies and the extravagant amounts of money we spent on absolutely nothing during that period. And it seemed at first as if we were going to get away with it and that it was like, oh, that that's fine. The economy's bounced right back. And and there was nothing wrong with having that response to COVID because, because we haven't suffered any consequences. And then it, well, it, it, because economics is a slow lumbering beast and it, it you know, the, 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 the results take a while to show up and they're showing up. Um, it, it, there's a way in which the war in Ukraine is, is doing politicians a favor because it helps disguise the fact that a lot of this inflation is um, not uh, due to Russia's invasion, but it is due to the excesses of pandemic response. And um, you can see that in the, the creeping up of inflation well before February 24th. Andrew, I take Lionel's point that uh, journalists should probably shouldn't exaggerate uh, how important we are in the world. But uh, perhaps what I was getting at is maybe social media, uh, since everyone is a journalist in a way on social media. 
Uh, and that contributes, Twitter in particular, to a kind of hysteria about things and a, and a lack of a sense of perspective. Yes, I mean, I think, you know, we journalists, we do like bad news uh, because for some reason we think it sells. Uh, or maybe it's just more dramatic than good news. Uh, and, uh, and social media has that in spades. I mean, it amplifies bad news. No one on social media, or very few people, actually tweet good news. There is one web, there is one uh, Twitter feed uh, in Britain, which, which does announce Jefferson, I think, is called announces you know, new investments in British industry and uh, new infrastructure and so on. It's like a lone voice. It's one little ray of sunshine in a whole Twitter feed of misery uh, there, and I think that has helped to amplify. There is also a. a a particularly British characteristic at work here is not true where I am at the moment on the American side of the Atlantic, which is that, that there's a whole industry in Britain doing ourselves down. Uh, indeed, there are some people are never happy unless they're doing ourselves down, unless they're doing the country down. And I think the whole Brexit debate made that worse because the, the Remainers... Um, they want to be vindicated in the stance they took and they want the Brexiteers to be proved wrong. And so much is still seen through this prism of remain or leave. And they want Britain to fail because that will vindicate the decision they took to vote not to leave and show that all these Brexiteers were wrong in what they did. So that's added to the the general predisposition of the British chattering classes to do the country down. Well, Andrew, I'll, I'll stay with you. You are in New York at the moment. Uh, the latest economic news from America seems to be a little bit uh, more cheerful. Uh, inflation seems to be coming down. Uh, do you get a sense that uh, that can-do American spirit is still there and they feel that next year is going to be a, a year in which America bounces back? Yeah, I mean, the can-do spirit is still here, but it's not where I am. It's not in New York. I mean, New York is a shadow of its former self at the moment. It's a parts of it look like a shanty town. It's quite, you know, it's a city I love, and I've been coming here and living here off and on since 1976. And it's back to the 70s. I mean, we talked about the 70s. New York, in many ways, is back to the 70s. It's dilapidated, it's shabby. It's got people shouting at you in the street. It's got a threatening sense to it again. Crime is rising. The place is filthy. Retail stores are closed. I mean, I'm not in exactly the poorest part of New York. I'm in Midtown, and I just need to go up to Second Avenue, and every second retail unit is closed. I mean, you. the contrast with London is quite dramatic. I mean, you in London now, you almost really wouldn't know there had been a pandemic. Uh, London is just kind of back to normal now. New York is not back to normal at all. And it looks to me it will be, a, it's actually got more decline in it before it gets back to that, that. But as we all know, New York is not America. And other parts of America are, are, are doing well. Outside the big cities, the country is coming back. And I think as always, you know, New America was kind of first into this recession. Uh, I don't think the recession will be very deep and it will be first out. Inflation is beginning to come down. There's been a huge, you add Mr. Trump and Mr. Biden together, there's been an incredible amount of Keynesian pump priming, which contributed, as Lionel was saying, to inflation. You can't blame it all on the, uh, the war, that's for sure, uh, in Ukraine. Um, but I do think America will come out of it uh, more quickly and help to drag up the rest of the world economy. Because where else, where else are we going to get this growth? It ain't coming from Europe, that's for sure. Europe is heading for a serious recession. China is in its 94th lockdown. Um, and in, actually, its economy is really stuttering now. You can forget all predictions that China will overtake the American economy in this decade in size. That ain't going to happen. So I think it's good that America uh, will begin to get its act together again. Lionel, let's keep with America, but move to politics. Uh, the last time I think I spoke to you on Spectator TV was after the midterms. And you were in quite a good mood because, uh, not just because the red wave hadn't happened, but because uh, Trumpist candidates, uh, as many people have noticed, got defeated, all the, the Senate candidates in particular, were defeated. Uh, does that give you cause for optimism in 2023 that uh, certainly the American right might return to something you regard more as sanity? 
Well, the statistics would not bear that out. Not yet. You know, if you look at the polls of Republican voters, the majority of them still support Trump. And the real question is whether or not they come to their senses in time. And there's not very much time left. Uh, a year from now. I think that the party has to have some sense of resolution about which direction they're going. And what's really frustrating is that, you know, they have, they have a wide open door in the White House. Uh, the, the Republicans could simply walk away with the executive branch in 24 if they just ran someone who wasn't Trump. Um, the, 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 this Trump thing is is a drive to self-destruction. And um, I, honestly, I, I am certain DeSantis could do it. There are probably a number of candidates who can do it. I think that, that DeSantis is probably the, the best bet. But I feel that there's a funny kind of clock ticking, little by little, uh, Trump supporters are somewhat reduced in number and nothing happens in the news in relation to that guy that would you would think increase his support aside from uh, of this whole persecution problem and that's that's one thing that he's capitalizing on now so that despite the fact that he's a former president of the United States he's running as an underdog and that that you know, that plays into the natural paranoia of his supporters because they they do think that the world is against them and that um, most of what's, most of Trump's shenanigans are due to, you know, the FBI and every other deep state organization coming after him. Um, you know, I, 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 I don't, personally, as a former Biden voter, it looks, you know, I don't want him to run again. I don't want, and that's true, that makes me like the majority of the country. And something like three quarters of American voters say they don't want either one of those two elderly gentlemen to be running again. And I, you know, I have tremendous concerns about Biden's uh, mental facilities and they're certainly not going to be getting any better by the time he's 86. Uh, I, I had concerns about Trump and, and just how much he may have deteriorated. Because if you look at earlier recordings of Trump when he was younger, he was far more articulate. He spoke in complete sentences, and he didn't use the same word over and over again. It, uh, he himself has also degenerated. And, you know, it's a big country and we can do better. But, uh, you know, it is not impossible from this perspective that we end up with another Trump-Biden election in 24. And I just, what's wrong with us? <laughs> That's just terrible, terrible. Well, let's, let's cross back uh, across the Atlantic uh, and talk about Westminster, because after all, Lionel, we've had a pretty crazy year in British politics too. We've had uh, three prime ministers... We've lost count of how many chancellors, so much so that at the Spectator Awards recently, our Parliamentarian Awards, we had a Chancellor of the Year uh, award. Um, I wonder to you, uh, probably a bit of a silly question, but um, w which politics seems crazier uh, to you as an American in Britain, British or American? I I'm sorry, I really have to opt for the Americans. We think <laughs> with everything. I was hoping that that would push us towards a conversation about Britain, but okay, we can go back to America. I, I, I just, the, the, the shenanigans in the UK are on a completely different and, I have to say, lesser scale. It's, it's, it's not of great consequence in, in the big picture. And even the uh, market's overreaction to Liz Truss, uh, that has settled down, and I don't think it has had huge long-term uh, consequences, those interest rates were going up anyway. So uh, I, I think that on, on the level of crazy, we have you beat. It's, you don't have anyone uh, like Trump in the wings threatening to take over the country. Everyone is 
relatively credible. That's that's no doubt true. But uh, Andrew, I mean, the, the, it hasn't been a good year for the Tory party. I think that's a fair thing to say. Yeah. Um, we'll file um, that. We'll file that under British understatement. Well, yeah. So uh, I think um, I mean, can Rishi Sunak turn it around for the Tory party or is Labour's lead now unassailable going into the next general election? There's an outside chance he can turn it around. I don't think you can count that out. The country's not actu- actually gagging for Keir Starmer. Um, but it's probably not likely that he wins the election so much as the Tories lose it. Uh, so he could turn it around if he can get on to- if we can get out of the recession, get on top of inflation, get some growth back, living standards rising again, get out of this cost of living crisis, then I wouldn't count, count it out. But there is a mountain to climb. I mean, it's perfectly possible in retrospect that uh, historians will say 2022 was the year the Tories lost the election, uh, you know, because they've just been self-indulgent and concerned with their own internal tribal divisions. And they seem to have lost any purpose for governing the country. You know, what, what, what's the purpose of a Tory government now, uh, except to do lots of non-Tory things? like raise taxes to the highest level in 70 years. It, it seems like a government that's just kind of run out of steam. And, and even a new leader like Mr Sunak, uh, who is bright and uh, has lots of attractions, I think, he, you know, he seems to be, he's a bright guy, he seems a nice guy, but he's yet to give them a sense of purpose. He's yet to reinvigorate the government which new leaders can do. I mean, even John Major, not exactly the most invigorating character, taking over from Margaret Thatcher, he did invigorate the Tories by enough uh, to win the 1992 election. But there's no sign that Mr. Sunak does that yet. Um, I remember in 1979, uh, after uh, five years of uh, rather desolatory Labour government, Jim Callaghan was the Prime Minister, and he was up against Margaret Thatcher in the spring of 79, or early summer of 79. And as people were debating in his inner circle, could he beat Thatcher? The polls were not that much against him. He said, there just comes a time when the, the whole atmosphere turns against you, that when the, just the, the climate is against you, and it doesn't matter what you do, you are not going to win. That turned out to be true in 79. It was definitely true in 97 when John Major lost by a landslide to Tony Blair. The danger for the Tories is it's now true for Mr Sunak's Tories. A lot of people are saying, Andrew, that um, you know, uh, reformist parties, the reform party, populist parties on the right may now re- have a resurgence because Brexit had sort of shot the UKIP fox. Uh, but now um, an angry right is re-emerging. Do you see signs of that? No, I don't, actually. Uh, I don't see signs of that. And I think it's wishful thinking on the hardline Brexiteers. Um, I'm also not sure that Mr Farage wants to leave his rather comfortable perch in a 24-hour news station, which earns him a lot of money to go and do that. I don't see any... I, I think beyond the sort of square mile where you are, Freddie, nobody wants to relitigate that referendum. <laughs> nobody <laughs> wants to go back through the Brexit the Remainer leave arguments. Most people just, want, for good or ill, they just want to move on. The cards have, have lie where they lie, and we just need to get on with it. And, and interesting, that is the view of Keir Starmer as well. He doesn't want to breathe. There are people around him who would love to do it. He's not going to do it. So I think, no, the, the Reform Party is not going to have a demonstrable influence on British politics uh, that it hopes it, it might have. I think it's back in England, at least it's back to Labour Conservative. Even the Lib Dems, Freddie, don't seem to be making much of a breakthrough because Mr Starmer has made it possible for Lib Dem-minded people to vote Labour again. They don't need to vote for <laughs> the leader of the Liberal Democrats, who I can just remember, Mr Davey. Um, and one of the interesting things, too, is that if it is time, if it's Labour's turn again, that cauterizes, sidelines the whole Scottish separatist movement because it is much harder to run a separatist campaign against a Labour government in London than a Conservative government in London. So, you know, I think there are quite big changes uh, quite watershed events uh, about to happen in Britain uh, as a result of 
the way things are at the, the, the moment. I would say it's three, four to one against the Tories winning the next election. But we know things can change. And, you know, we live in, you know, who would have seen the Ukraine war coming? I mean, I was very optimistic about the economy of this year, but on both sides of the Atlantic, I saw growth returning, investment returning and all the rest of it. Uh, Lionel's right, inflation was starting to rise. The central banks made a terrible call uh, on that and we've all suffered for that. But I still thought there would be some growth. And I never saw the Ukraine war. There are just, what was it, Don Rumsfeld said? I think that was one of these unknown unknowns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. let, let, let us wrap this up, uh, if I may, oh, uh, on, a, on, a, on an attempt at a more cheerful note, because Christmas is supposed to be a source of uh, optimism for humanity. Uh, Andrew, uh, in our Christmas edition, uh, I'll start with you, Andrew. In our Christmas edition, we asked various contributors, including uh, the Dalai Lama, amazingly enough, uh, if, uh, what gives them hope? Um, so I wonder, Andrew, going into 2023, what gives you hope? Well, I don't know what the Dalai Lama said, but whatever he said, I agree with. <laughs> I've interviewed him. He's the most impressive person I've ever interviewed. Uh, and you're speaking to the least spiritual person in the world here. Um, listen, I here's the thing. I think Ukraine is going, in 2023, Ukraine is going to win the war. What does win look like? That's debatable. But for sure, Russia ain't going to win it. And I think Ukraine wins it and it will be a terrible defeat uh, for Russia. And suddenly things will get back to normal and we'll be pouring resources into Ukraine to help build it. I think inflation will come down much more quickly than the forecasters say, just as it went up much more quickly than the forecasters uh, thought. Indeed, if you begin to look at uh, towards the end of 2024 or 25, you begin to see deflation beginning to take a grip. But for a while, as inflation plummets, it'll make us feel better, it'll raise our living standards and we'll come out of the cost of living and a, a, a crisis. And if people start to spend more again, then growth returns to the economy. So I don't despair. You know, both as journalists and uh, as politicians, we find it very hard to, to discern when the trend we're living through comes to an end and we kind of act as if trees grow to the sky that you know inflation is now double digits it's always going to be double digits we uh, we've got no growth we're going to have no growth for the foreseeable future i think there'll be quite a dramatic turnaround led by america uh in in the economic outlook and that so i am more positive on the economic out outlook in as 2023 proceeds we're heading into recession there's no doubt about that, but I don't think it's going to be that deep or that long. And I think as prices start to fall more quickly than the forecasters think, and you already begin to see a bit of that in America now as well, the, the economic optimism will return. So I don't think there's a need for endless gloom, however much some people need to feel they should be in endless gloom just to keep them happy. Thank you, Andrew. You've cheered me up, which is almost impossible at the moment. Uh, Lionel, what gives you hope? Um, I've been much cheered by what's been going on in China um, on, on multiple levels. I mean, it is satisfying as someone who has opposed COVID lockdowns from the very beginning to see uh, the, that policy taken to the max and to see it fail. It doesn't work. And lockdown came from China and it's dying in China. It's also a relief to see the Chinese people be able to draw a line and say enough is enough. Uh, I think we in the West often write the Chinese off as just hopelessly compliant and they'll do whatever they're told. They have turn into little automatons, but they're not. And, uh, and you know, they suffer under a, a huge amount of control and oppression and, and someone is always watching them. I don't feel envious. But there have been a lot of people who have now stuck their necks out and, and even in defiance of such would-be absolute control say, we're not taking this anymore. And I, I think that's a really good sign. So it's, it's good for uh, the spectacle uh, uh, internationally of a, a highly destructive uh, response to disease. It's, it's good that it, it looks bad. I, w I was 
amused how many Western media outlets uh, responded to the Chinese protests. It's like, oh, of course, this, you know, this policy is terrible. It doesn't work. <laughs> Where were you two years ago, you bastards? Um, and I, I, I also think that what's going on in Iran is, is, is cheerful. I mean, yeah. amid, amidst a lot of horror. I mean, they are, they're now starting to execute protesters. But this is, again, this is a, it is mostly young women who will not take it anymore. And, and um, I think that uh, it's, it's been well observed that the left in the West doesn't seem remotely interested, which is bizarre. I mean, when you think about, well, isn't this the ultimate... Me Too patriarchy, um, where where you have to go around, you know, in a bin liner. I mean, it's it it's a horribly repressive regime for for women in particular, and it's bizarre to me that the women's movement in the West is not interested. But I'm interested, and right. and I really wish them the best. I mean, I am a little skeptical because. So many of these revolutions come to nothing, think the Arab Spring. But, but before this one also comes to nothing, I'm going to be optimistic. Well, I can't think of a better note to end it on. Uh, human freedom will always flourish. Uh, Andrew Neal and Lionel Schreiber, thank you very much and a very happy Christmas to you both. Thank you. Merry Christmas to you too.